Heavenly Father, that you would come and walk among us and enter into the, the sheepfold that we are, and that you would be near to us as our greatest comfort. And we can truly say, Lord, as the psalmist did, we affirm his words that we, we have everything we need. We lack nothing because of the good shepherd, your son, Jesus. And we pray now that as we open um, our Bibles together and as we look at Romans as a whole this morning, that, Lord, we would see him more clearly. Lord, that we would see really truly how bad the bad news is so that we might see how profound your provision of grace is. Lord, please open our eyes that we might see how effective grace and how effective effectual your spirit is in our lives. Let us see how ineffective our remaining indwelling weakness is, how ineffective law as a power is, so that we might all the more cast ourselves with humble faith upon your son and upon your grace, that we might look more and more like him. But we thank you for this opportunity to be before your word. Lord, may it truly um, be over us rather than us sitting over your word. Grant us the place of humility now and Lord, accept our worship here. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, take your Bibles this morning and let's jump back into Paul's letter to the Romans. I actually want you to turn to chapter 15. We're just gonna skip all that middle section. We're just gonna try to get closer to the edge, the end. I'm just kidding. But I want to start in Romans 15 at some point here. What we're doing this morning is we finished um, the first six chapters of Romans, and so we're going to just do a kind of a summary like we've done uh, now and then throughout the letter. The gospel of Jesus Christ is uniquely unfolded and unveiled in Paul's letter to the Roman believers. In this one location in your Bible, in this one letter is gospel riches, gospel treasure, gospel brilliance, and gospel beauty beyond measure. In fact, it's the longest treatment, gospel treatment, in any one letter in your New Testament. And so that makes it somewhat intimidating. Its length can be intimidating. So what we're doing is we're dividing it up into smaller subsections and reviewing through them periodically to help us get the whole argument as it unfolds. So today we're pausing again after a couple of the main sections, chapters 5 and 6, to review the bigger picture of Romans and then to review where we've been specifically. And what I hope this accomplishes is, um, especially for those of you who perhaps joined our study late, uh, you weren't here for Romans 1, you weren't here for the introduction to it, um, but maybe you dropped in in chapter 5 or you dropped in in chapter 6 somewhere. It gives you a chance to become better acquainted with the whole, even though you arrived later on. So we can kind of catch ourselves all back up here. So what we're going to do is start number one this morning with just Romans as a whole, and we're just going to remember what this letter is really all about. And then later we'll review Romans 1 to 6, where we've been, and then we'll offer some pastoral encouragement, primarily from Romans 6, some concluding thoughts from there, and then I want to introduce to you Romans 7, okay? Okay be the best two hours of your life. <laughs> Romans is a God-breathed missionary support letter. That's what Romans is. A God-breathed missionary support letter. God desired that in his Bible that a missionary support letter would occupy prime real estate. It's amazing. A missionary wrote to a church that he had never been to before enlisting their support as he aimed for untouched regions beyond them. The Apostle Paul is the missionary. The believers in Rome are the church that he has never yet been to, and Spain is the untouched mission field. Now, as I've been thinking about this and reviewing back through, and I look on our own um, missions movement of our day that we kind of all... Um, are a part of that generation 
So much of missions today is theologically bankrupt. So much of missions today is primarily man-centered. And it is becoming increasingly gospel-less. It's modern-day missions movement is about almost everything except the preaching of the gospel anymore. But that's not what this letter is about at all. It is theologically rich and deep, not bankrupt. It's not man-centered. It's God-centered. It's Jesus-exalting. It's spirit-loving. This missionary letter actually must be the bedrock that every generation's missions movement stands on. Our, our modern-day missions movement needs Paul's letter to the Romans. And Paul wrote this letter to the believers in Rome about A.D. 56. He was finishing up his third missionary journey while he was in Corinth. He was in Corinth for about a three-month period in Acts 20. We believe that's when he wrote this letter. So as his third missionary journey was winding down and he was getting ready to take the, the gift from all of the Gentile churches to the poor church in Jerusalem, Paul surveyed the Mediterranean world that he had traversed over the last 10 years in three missionary journeys, and he believed that it was now time for him to go further to the west with the gospel to Spain, where no one had yet taken the gospel. And Rome would be the perfect church and location from which to launch that mission. I want you to look at chapter 15, verse 20, 23. So remember, he's writing from Corinth, chapter 15, verse 23. He says to the Romans, with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have had for many years a longing to come to you whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there by you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. But now I'm going to Jerusalem serving the saints. Drop down to verse 28. Therefore, when I have finished this trip to Jerusalem and have put my seal on this fruit of theirs, the Gentiles, their gift, I will go on by way of you to Spain. Now, that was Paul's plan. He had no idea he'd be arrested. Well, he actually did have an idea he was going to be arrested in Jerusalem. He was told that over and over. And then he was in prison for two years in Caesarea, and then he was on a shipwreck, and then eventually did make his way to the Romans by the end of Acts. But Paul, in the meantime, while he's in Corinth, he hasn't seen the Romans yet, he can do something very profitable. There was something Paul could do before he was physically with them. He could write out his gospel that God gave to him, and he did. And he did it to make sure that his relationship with the church and Rome was founded on that gospel. That meant he had to write it out for them to help them understand the height of it, the breadth of it, the width of it, the depth of that gospel. So he wrote it out. He, he could, uh, how could he begin to partner with them on the way to Spain if they didn't hold to the same gospel he did, if they were not established on it and in it? We know that at this point in AD 56 that no apostle planted this church in Rome. Paul had never been there himself personally. He knows many of the believers there, Romans 16. He's able to name many of them by name. But it was nevertheless a church without the direct influence of an apostle. So before Paul partners with them in taking the gospel to Spain, he first wants to make sure the church in Rome is well established in the gospel that he preaches. In fact, let me show you the bookends on the letter that it's all about being established in the gospel. Look at Romans chapter 1, verses 11 to 15. And then we'll come back to chapter 16, verse 25. This is kind of the, the bookends on your letter. Chapter 1, verse 11, Paul says to them, I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. This is why I want to see you. I want you to be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both your faith and my faith. Whenever the, a believer believed, it meant something to Paul. It mattered to him. I, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you, 
and have been prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. They are already believers. But when you preach the gospel to believers, they become established in the gospel. And then the letter ends in chapter 16, verse 25. He says, now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret from long ages past. So Paul's intent with this letter is they must be established in his gospel. And everything from between chapter 1 and chapter 16 is about that amazing gospel of Jesus Christ that not only saves sinners who believe, but a gospel that is powerful enough to transform their lives and their living into the image of Jesus Christ. Everything between is the multifaceted gospel. In fact, we could probably summarize Paul's letter this way. I'll put it for you up on the screen here. The gospel will establish us. This is the purpose of him writing. The gospel will establish us. And then, because it's a missionary support letter, it will endear us to the expansion of the gospel. We'll be established by it, and then because by its very nature and character, it is a missionary support letter, it will compel us to take the gospel to places it has not yet gone. This is the kind of letter God wanted to occupy prime real estate in his Bible. One letter does all of that. And the question for you at the beginning is, first of all, do you, do you know this gospel? It's the good news concerning Jesus Christ and his death at the cross for sinners, for the salvation of sinners. And the call in the gospel is to turn away from yourself, to turn away from your sin, and to turn away from good works that you might try to do from a set of laws, but instead to just put humble faith in Jesus Christ so as to be saved, saved from the wrath of God that you and I both deserve. The gospel and faith in the gospel is a declared, brings about a a declared righteousness from God. The very status of righteousness that is his, it is given through faith alone in Jesus alone apart from any good works. Do you know this gospel? But there's more. You must be established on it, established in it. Do you cling to the sufficiency of this gospel to save you from the wrath of God? Do you you experience its power in your life daily? Do you believe that it is solid enough to support you through anything that you'll ever face in this life? Romans is the letter for you and for me. And the effect that it must have on you as a missionary support letter in your Bible is this, as you become more established in it. Why are there still people who do not know it? We must take it to further regions beyond us, to people down the street, to people at school. How can I take it to them? How can I help others to go to places that I'll never go? Well, let's now transition to the specific sections of this letter. That's Romans as a whole. Now, let's talk about where we've been, Romans 1 to 6. And I just encourage you to start in chapter 1. If you've got an old-fashioned Bible with paper and stuff like that, you can kind of just go back to where we were at in the early parts. Let's talk about the first section. Romans 1, 1 to 15 is about the apostle of gospel righteousness. Um, You're going to see gospel righteousness or a phrase like that in almost every single one of these little subtitles. Because the gospel has a righteousness that is inseparably, uniquely tied to itself and to the preaching of it, to the believing of the gospel. And the first 15 verses of chapter 1 introduce us to the Apostle Paul. This is his longest introduction in any of his letters because he's introducing himself to a church that he does not know. So a longer introduction is needed. And he is the apostle of this gospel righteousness. Upon fully introducing himself, 
Paul lays out the grand, uh, the grand subject of his gospel interest in the letter. That takes us to Romans 1, verses 16 and 17, unique enough to stand all on its own in the entire letter, uh, the revelation of gospel righteousness. Look at verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, Paul says, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from one person's faith to the next person's faith. That's the idea there of from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous by faith shall live. Paul does something very interesting upon mentioning the gospel. He makes a beeline for the righteousness of God in it. The gospel reveals the righteousness of God in some way in connection with faith. If you're going to look for God's righteousness, there's a place to look. Look for where saving faith is. That's the place to be looking for. You don't look where good works are. Not going to find God's righteousness there. You don't look for where faith and good works are trying to work together. Like you can believe Jesus, but you need to do some good things first also. You don't look there for God's righteousness. You look uniquely to one place only where faith alone is. That is where God's very righteousness is being revealed. The righteous status that God himself has, he gives through faith the faith of the one believing Jesus. It is the righteousness that God declares over the sinner who believes. This is the great theme. This is the great heart. This is the great foundation of the letter. This righteous status that God gives to the sinner through faith and not by works of law gets fleshed out in great detail in chapters three and four. We'll be there in just a moment. The phrase justification by faith alone is the idea of being declared righteous with God's very status of righteousness by faith alone, through faith alone. The righteousness of God is what Paul loved to see be revealed everywhere, every time any sinner believed Jesus Christ. From faith to faith, that's what he was looking for. That's why he wanted to put his faith in Jesus Christ together with their faith. They would be mutually encouraged by it because God's righteousness is revealed there in their faith and through their faith. He wasn't ashamed of that gospel that did that. This again is why we have gospel righteousness kind of in each of the subtitles wherever possible. That takes us to the next section, which is heartbreaking. Romans 1, 18 to 32, we called it the Gentiles of unrighteousness. So there is the righteousness of God associated with the preaching of the gospel and faith, and then there is just mankind out there. There is the unrighteousness of mankind everywhere. Look at verse 16 again. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, dot, 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 for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, dot, 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 verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. Mankind across every nation is propagating his own unrighteousness everywhere. The only response God can have to that unrighteousness is his wrath. And his wrath is presently being revealed against all of that ungodliness and unrighteousness. The nations of mankind, they stand in solidarity, in a oneness, in this unrighteousness. This indictment is not restricted to any one people group. This is a one-sized-fits-all indictment that covers all of mankind. So among an unrighteous humanity where God's wrath is currently being revealed, the special way that God is revealing His own righteousness is when they believe, when one of those unrighteous ones believes. It's amazing. And that's what drove Paul. For Paul on his missionary journeys, it was more about God's righteousness being put on display than it was really about anything else. And by the way, sinners get saved when that happens. It's pretty amazing. That leads us to the next section, 
Romans chapter 2 to chapter 3, verse 20, the Jews of unrighteousness. The, the primary argument that Paul is making in this next major section of Romans is that sinners, in response to hearing that one-size-fits-all indictment over everybody, sinners tend to want to exempt themselves from that indictment of unrighteousness. And have you ever noticed this, right? There's something that wells up within each one of us when guilt is ascribed to us, there's something that wells up inside us where we believe, no, 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 I, I'm the exception to this indictment. I am. I should not be included in that indictment. We protest a one-size-fits-all indictment. And so Romans chapter 2 to chapter 3 verse 20 labors thoroughly and effectively to not let any one man peel himself off away from the unrighteous lump of humanity that he or she is a part of. We are all in such a tight, unrighteous union and bond with each other. And the gospel argument starts very generically, very broadly at the beginning of Romans chapter 2, where Romans chapter 1 left off, as it deals with the protest to that indictment. But Paul leads that argument right into the very heart of the Jew by chapter 3. If any man, any human being, thought he had reason to separate himself out from and away from all of the rest of them who were getting the indictment, if there was anybody who felt that way, it was the Jew, because he was special to Yahweh. Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 10. And notice how Paul labors by this point in this section. He labors to keep the whole world of mankind from being fragmented. Nobody gets to break themselves off here, not even the Jew. But instead, he maintains the solidarity that mankind has under the guilt of their own unrighteousness. Look at verse 10. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. He can't find, <clears throat> the psalmist can't find one exception anywhere. And then he puts them all together. All have turned aside. Together, they have become useless. There is no one who does good. There is not even one. He says down in chapter 3, verse 22, there is no distinction. Nobody has distinguished himself from the rest. The Jew fell under the same indictment of unrighteousness, of unrighteous, and he was as guilty as the rest. No one, even the Jew, had distinguished himself as innocent or even less guilty than the rest. And so just notice where that leaves you at the end of this section, Paul just led every single one of us, all of humanity, down to the bottom of a lead encased hole of guilt. And there we all sit. And it's Teflon coated. You, you can't burrow your way out of the guilt and solidarity that you have with everyone else. It's, it's a lead indictment. You can't get through it. And you can't climb your way up out of the guilt you can't protest your way out of the solidarity. There's no place for you to go except sit there in the stew and the mess of humanity. And every mouth is closed. Look at chapter 3, verse 19. Now we know that whatever law says, the law says it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. You see, nobody's broken off from the rest. There you sit, there I sit, no matter who you are, no matter what your pedigree is, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've kept yourself from doing, you're guilty, I'm guilty, we're unrighteous, ungodly, and worthy of wrath with the rest. That's where the gospel begins with you and me. That's where it first leads us, and it's bad news. But it's bad news, not just about you individually or personally. It is. But it's about the bad news of us corporately as human beings. If we are going to be saved personally, individually, something has to happen to the corporate problem. 
that we are cemented in. And herein lies the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. The next section, Romans 3, 21 to 4, to the end of chapter 4. This is the faith of gospel righteousness. The faith of gospel righteousness. What is our hope as we sit in that indivisible mass of unrighteous humanity? Well, God is prepared in his mercy and in his grace to give to you what you do not have. To give what we ourselves cannot generate ourselves. To give to us what causes him to rejoice every time he sees it. Imagine this, that God would give you a gift that when he sees that gift he gave, he rejoices seeing it. What is it? It's his righteousness. We don't have his righteousness. We can't generate his righteousness ourselves. That is what causes him the greatest joy of all when he sees it. It is his own righteousness. And your only hope is that even though all you have ever been in that unrighteous lump of humanity is unrighteous, your only hope is that God might somehow, might somehow see over you his very own righteousness. How does that happen? It happens by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. Look at chapter 3, verse 21. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith." This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. It's all about faith and faith alone. And we tend to think similarly as the Jews did in Paul's day, that God will be different toward me. God will be different toward me. He'll see what I've been up to. He'll he'll see my pedigree. He'll see where I come from. A Jew would say that. He'll see I come from Abraham. And he'll see how I have distinguished myself from others. And that leads Paul into Romans chapter 4. It is the fruit of Paul's preaching of justification by faith alone over 10 years and three missionary journeys. It shows us exactly how Paul dealt with the unique Jewish-oriented challenges that he faced as he preached the gospel from one synagogue to the next across the Roman Empire. Some of the most severe protests that he faced um, in his preaching of Jesus Christ came from these Jews. When the Jews protested the gospel's very central thrust of justification by faith alone in Jesus alone, Paul answered those very protests with the Old Testament and specifically with the faith of Abraham. And this is what is really great for you and I who have the the rest of the New Testament. It's one of the enduring fruits of Romans chapter 4 that we who believe Jesus by faith alone, we can actually turn to our Old Testament to prove salvation by grace alone through faith alone. The example of Abraham is the example. And that leads us next to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. We could title this section, The Grace of Gospel Righteousness. The Grace of Gospel Righteousness. Look how chapter 5 begins, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, dot, 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 That signals that it's time to consider now the blessed outcomes that accompany justification by faith alone. And the very first thing on Paul's mind is worship. Verse 2, at the end, we exult in the hope of the glory of God. Verse 3, we also exult in our tribulations. Verse 11, through whom, um, I'm sorry, uh, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That word exult is a worshipful expression of overwhelming joy and satisfaction. It is not a boring worship word. It is a rich and vibrant and challenging kind of worship for each one of us to consider. Justified believers are to be first and foremost one thing, 
fervent worshipers of Jesus Christ. Joyful worshipers of God through Jesus Christ. Before any more details or any more of the implications that follow from justification by faith alone, before anything else can even come, what Paul wants to make sure of is that we are all the right kind of people to receive it. And that means we must be worshipers to receive what's coming next. And the whole rest of the letter, we must be those who exult in God. If you want to understand sanctification, if you want to understand um, God's unique relationship with Israel in 9, 10, and 11, if you want to understand how you should live together as a family in 12, 13, and 14, if you want all of that, you need to be one who exults in Jesus Christ. These are all the implications and the outcomes from justification by faith alone. And then comes that great section in verses 12 to 21 in chapter 5. And it provides another way of looking at the foundation of grace underneath the one who is the worshiper of Jesus Christ, the believer. And we actually find out in Romans 5, verses 12 to 21, more about our solidarity with fallen, sinful, enslaved humanity. We have union, we're told, or solidarity with Adam, the very first man. He set, unfortunately, the trajectory, and he poured the cement of sin out. And we have all, in our own spiritual deadness, we've sinned and we've jumped into that cement slab of slavery to sin with Adam. One spiritually dead pebble am I, cemented together with all of the other ones with Adam in lost humanity. We've been hardened, we've been cured together into an indivisible, solid mass of sinful, enslaved humanity in our collective spiritual deadness. Staggering. And then you get statements like this in 520, law came in so that transgression would increase. Not helpful. Law is just not helpful as a power. It only intensifies the sinful bond. So you are, what you find out in Romans 5 is you are not a lonely, solitary, dead sinner. But you are a pebble in a massive slab of cement of sin and death that wraps around the world of men. And the free gift of grace through Jesus Christ is superabundant beyond anything known to man. It reigns over us like a king, Romans 5 says. In the gospel, you have to see yourself rightly as an individual sinner. There's no doubt about that. But in the gospel, you are also called to see yourself rightly as inseparable from the rest of humanity until grace comes. And grace breaks you free by justification through faith alone. And once you are broken free from that old solidarity with Adam and his spiritually dead sinful people, listen, solidarity does not end. You were not rescued from that horrible solidarity to be solitary in your living. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you are now in solidarity with Jesus and his people, all because of this greater reign of grace through Jesus Christ. You see, you being saved, when you think about it, the first thoughts that come to your mind is, I can't believe what God has done for me. And what Romans 5 is revealing is we should be able to say, I cannot believe what God has done on a human level to to even redeem anybody out of this broken humanity. Broken is not a strong enough word. In God's eyes, you were never alone in your spiritual death and sin. You were never only an individual. You were never only an island. You weren't that way before God's grace saved you. And if he has saved you by his great grace, you are not merely an isolated individual right now either. But you are a part of his people, his family in Jesus Christ. The question you could ask yourself is to whom do you belong? Do you belong to Adam still, or do you belong to Jesus Christ? And the difference between Adam's people and Jesus' people is only one thing. What? Grace. We don't have a better set of laws than they do. 
We have grace. We have the reign of grace over our lives, which paves the way for Romans chapter 6, where we just finished. The slavery of gospel righteousness. In Romans 6, Adam's people are revealed even more clearly to be slaves to sin. And Jesus' people are slaves too, we find out. Four different times, as far as I can tell in Romans 6, we are spoken of as slaves of obedience to God. We are slaves of the word to which we were committed, the teaching. We are slaves of righteousness, and we are slaves of God himself. So Romans 6 tells you there are only two categories, and they're the same two categories that were in Romans 5. You're either with Adam, or you're with Jesus, or you are a slave to sin, or you are a slave to God. Only two kinds of human beings in the world, those two kinds. So by the end of Romans 5 and the beginning of Romans 6, we discover, though, that there is still an antagonist hanging around. He is the man who is completely skeptical of this grace that achieves that amazing individual and corporate salvation in chapter 5. This skeptic is offended by grace. And he's offended by grace because grace won't let him have what he loves most, which is his law and his ability, he thinks, with that law to produce righteousness. He thinks he can distinguish himself from the rest. Over and over, Paul came across these kinds of Jewish men on his missionary journeys. They were self-confident, law-loving, religious men. They believed law had a power of its own against sin. Sin was indeed to them a serious problem. Make no mistake about it. But nothing that a good set of religious laws couldn't overpower. And since grace said no to works of law, chapter 3, verse 20, by the works of law, no flesh will be justified. That's what grace says. By works of law, no man will be declared righteous. Because grace said no to that, the skeptics believed that meant grace was soft on sin. Permissive even regarding sin. In fact, even maybe in a twisted partnership with sin, after all, chapter 5, verse 20, where sin was increasing, grace abounded all the more. It looks like grace is benefiting where sin is growing. So Paul addressed the skepticism against grace in Romans 6. He defends the supreme, irreplaceable place of grace for the one who believes. If one comes under the power of grace, they will have absolutely everything they need against sin's presence. And so Romans 6 provides two defenses of grace against the two most common doubts and slander leveled against grace by the self-confident law-loving, religious man. The first one is in verses 1 to 14, and that first charge against grace by the skeptics is that from their mind, from their twisted thinking, if a person comes under the power of grace, they're already sinning. Grace doesn't tell them to stop sinning, but just believe. So if they're going to come under grace, they're just going to keep on sinning. There will be no break in the sin pattern. And Paul says that is the most offensive false charge against grace. Grace has achieved for the believer in Jesus Christ in the first 14 verses a new identity that comes through union with Christ crucified, Christ buried, and Christ raised from the dead. We are new creatures in Christ, to borrow Paul's language from 2 Corinthians 5. Now, sin is still the same old sin. Nothing changed there, and it is as present as ever in your life and in mine if we are under grace. But the one under grace is now a different person in the presence of the same old sins. That's the point in Romans 1, uh, 6, 1 to 14. You, believer, are not the slave to sin anymore, where you could only ever do its bidding without any resistance, but now you have been made into a new creature with new capacities to resist sin and to pursue righteousness. So grace's power is not ineffective towards sin. It's just the opposite. Because grace made you a new you in Christ. The second defense of grace against the doubts and slanders of the self-confident, law-loving, religious man has to do with battling sin here or there in the Christian life, Romans 6, 15. Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? May it never be. 
the self-confident, law-loving, religious man has no confidence in his mind, has no confidence in the power of grace if it has to face sin. He felt law as a power was supreme for that fight. You want to be under law, not under grace, he thought. And so the last half of Romans 6, Paul defends grace against this slander as well. Grace as a power is the only legitimate power against sin for you, believer. It has transferred you into a new slavery. Slavery to obedience to God. Slavery to uh, the teaching that you've been committed to from the word of God. A slave of righteousness. You've been transferred into a new identity of being a slave of God. And it is overwhelmingly shown that law as a power is worthless anywhere, every time, all the time. In fact, if you are still under law as a category, as a power, it is evidence that you actually are still a slave of sin that is spiritually dead in that slab of sinful humanity. But if you are under grace, that means you're in the new category of humanity in Jesus, the saved ones. You're a new creature. And you have, you have the only power against sin that God has designed. Grace. So that is where we have been thus far in our exposition of Romans. And so what I want to do number three this morning is maybe just draw one more pastoral encouragement from Romans chapter six. Number three, Romans one to six, pastoral encouragement. In chapter six, Paul writes about the certainty of the power of grace in the life of the believer with such ultimate language. Did you notice this as we kept going through it? With such ultimate language, victorious language, stunning declarations are made in Romans 6 about what grace has achieved for us such that it sounds like there is no reality possible less than what grace has accomplished. You get things like in Romans 6, verse 16, you are a slave of obedience resulting in righteousness. That is such an ultimate declaration. And I ask myself, all of the time? Verse 17, you became obedient from the heart. All of the time? Verse 18, you became slaves of righteousness, a slave of God. Verse 22, resulting in sanctification, resulting in holiness all all of the time? Paul speaks of grace's achievements in the believer such that it sounds like there is no failure in your fight against sin. And yet I know you feel what I feel. You feel the gap between where you really live and where these very real declarations concerning grace's victory are. How are we to navigate that? First thing I think is important is just to understand what Paul is doing in this chapter. He's showing the supremacy of grace. He is showing the irreplaceability of grace. He is showing the undeniable, always dependable power of grace because remember, grace is being contrasted against and above the power of law. There's another power that the antagonist is putting on the table next to the power of grace. And so Paul is pointing us to the power of grace. Paul is trying to eliminate any thought that there is a choice for you when it comes to powers. Powers to live under. So then the point is is not, first of all, your, in, in Romans 6, it's not your perfect submission to the perfect power. It's just the perfect power of grace. Grace. 
Maybe put another way, the focus primarily in Romans 6 is on the perfect master over the slave, if we could give grace that language of being a king reigning over his subjects. So the focus in Romans 6 is primarily on the perfect master over the slave. The focus in Romans 6 is not primarily, first of all, on the slave's performance under the master, although that is absolutely impacted by the master. Maybe another way to think about it is Romans 6 is about the war that has been won by grace, but you and I have a lot of battles to fight. And Romans 6 is not about, first of all, how you will win every single battle. It's that the war has been won by grace. And of course your battle is impacted by that. But Paul is trying to draw a contrast between the power of grace that won the war and the power of law that will keep you condemned if it stays as a power in your life. The conclusion you have to come to predominantly from Romans 6 is how unrivaled grace is as a power in your life as a believer. You must be convinced that there is no other rival power to consider. Listen, this is what it is not. It's, it's not like, well, you know, you can either go with AT&T or you can go with Verizon or you can go with T-Mobile. You know, there's pluses and minuses with all these different um, companies. That is not grace and law. Well, you kind of just got to pick. There's pluses and minuses either way. Paul is speaking of grace in such a way that you would take everything else off the table and see only what God has truly put there, which is his grace. He has only one power for you. It's grace. And there should be no surprise then that grace is presented as ultimately victorious. Because it is. It has won the war. It is overwhelmingly sufficient for everything you need. Grace has no flaw in it. Grace has no weakness in it. Grace has no inconsistency in it. Grace will never on any one of the days of your life have to say, well, I need to give you a qualification about myself that I didn't give you at the beginning. Grace will never have to do any of that in your fight against sin. So Romans 6, your confidence must grow, it must expand, it must be strengthened, it must be deepened as a result of Romans 6, your confidence in grace. And it is presented only in ultimate victorious terms. There's no other way it could be spoken of. But you're still left feeling and observing the gap between the perfect, powerful grace and your own weakness and failings under it in your fight against sin. So what do you do? First, where your living falters under grace and sin and where sin gets the upper hand, get to the bottom of it. You must get to the bottom of it. Open your Bible and carefully and thoroughly examine your life. Do not let sin ever be of no concern to you. Let your concern for sin only grow because of what you understand about grace and its victorious nature in your life. And it may actually be possible that for some, either your failings are so proliferate or you are so unconcerned about your sin that you should actually go all the way back over to the slab of sinful humanity and you should assess if what God says grace does when it savingly extracts a sinner, whether or not that has actually ever happened to you. So where your living falters under grace, get to the bottom of it. Secondly, become increasingly convinced of your own built-in remaining weakness. What grace has achieved is one thing, and what you carry with you still in your indwelling sin and weakness is another thing, and they are mixed together. Become increasingly skeptical of what you bring to the fight. Thirdly, humble faith. Cultivate humble faith in Christ, and in his grace toward you. Humble faith will make you look away from yourself. It'll make you look away from your own guilt. It will make you look away from um, you trying to do penance 
to establish a better standing. Humble faith will make you look away from yourself to grace. Humble faith will lead you to resolve more fervently to rely more fully on grace to fight the next temptation. Fourthly, find another pebble next to you. We're pebbles next to each other in a new solidarity. Uh, We're not alone in this fight. So find somebody next to you who's a believer who can help you walk. Ask for help. Lastly, this morning, where are we going next? Number four, Romans 7. Romans 7. We'll call this section the freedom of gospel righteousness. The freedom of gospel righteousness. Now, do you feel the tenor of Romans 6? Just victory. Just amazing, powerful grace towards us who believe. When you get to Romans chapter 7, you come across 27 uses of the word law or commandment. Law. That feels... That should feel, if you read Romans 5 and 6, then 7, that should feel a little bit like a step backwards, maybe? Now, Paul knows what he's doing. But we just, we were just talking about grace. So what is all this law speak now? After such a convincing presentation on grace in Romans 6, Why such a dense treatment of law? And the answer is, Paul is not yet done making his case in the contrast between grace and law. If you thought Romans 6 was sufficient enough and you're like, I get it. No, you don't have it yet. You need to see Romans 7. Romans 5 and 6, they put the focus on the exalted power of grace in the face of your sinfulness to extract you out of the sinful slab of solidarity with everyone else and to sanctify you. That was the focus. Paul is now going to take one more chapter to do that, but he's going to do it from the side of law. Law as a power. Law as a power is utterly entirely ineffective in the face of your sinfulness to savingly extract you out of the slab of sinful humanity and then also to sanctify you. Your sinfulness and law, listen carefully, your sinfulness and law must never be in a relationship with one another because law will only wreck you spiritually. You And law, you must be freed from law. Look at Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Or do you not know, brethren? Paul's talking to believers. Do you not know, believers? And then he qualifies who he's talking to in the believers. For I am speaking to those who know law. So he's narrowing himself. Who would be the believers in a church who would know about law? I believe that's the Jews who have come to faith, just like he has. Don't you know this? That the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. Then when is he free from it? When he dies. Verse 4. He gives an illustration in verses 2 and 3 that we'll look at soon enough. Verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law, through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead. You see, that's being put into the other solidarity with Jesus. In order for what? That finally, you might bear fruit for God. If there's any hesitation in your mind as you hear this talk about Paul emphasizing You want law separate from you as a power. If there's any temptation to think that that means we're going to be lawless people, you don't have to worry about it because Paul over and over and over and over says you're a slave of righteousness. You become obedient from the heart. You will finally be fruitful for God when you are freed from law. And then what Paul does in verses 7 to the end of the chapter, 
is he provides for us a window into his own life when he and law as a power were inseparable. And Romans 7 reveals a losing fight going on. It was a devastating bondage that he was in with law, a devastating relationship. No doubt an internal conflict was going on within him. Romans 6, we could talk about in one sense, is is the war has been won, now go fight some battles that remain. That's victory. Romans chapter 7 is you're fighting, but you're losing. That's Paul. So the gospel development that's taking place in these chapters as we finish up can be put this way. Romans 5 and 6, all about the supremacy of grace as a power in the face of your sin, in the face of your sin to save you, to extract you out of the sinful slab of humanity, and then to sanctify you. Grace is victorious. That's Romans 5 and 6. Skip 7. Romans 8, we'll be there in a few years. It's all about the supremacy of the Holy Spirit as the indwelling spirit of power in your life such that you can be sanctified, you can become increasingly holy. So you've got Romans 5 and 6 all about the supremacy of grace. You've got Romans 8 about the supremacy of the spirit of God and the victory in your life through him. What is Romans 7? The devastating bondage that sin and law are in together and you must be freed from it and you have to be convinced of this. It takes a whole chapter to do that. You do not have ability to save yourself. You do not have any power to sanctify yourself. If you add law which has no power to save you and law which has no power to sanctify you, you put those two powerless things together, you are doomed and you must be separated from it. And that sits sandwiched between the two glorious realities of God's grace and God's spirit in the believer's life. That means in the coming weeks, believer, love the grace of God even more. Anticipate getting to know the Holy Spirit better in Romans chapter eight for your sanctification. And in the coming weeks, put absolutely no confidence in the devastating combination between the power of law and sinful flesh. Put no confidence there. God's grace is sufficient. God's spirit of holiness is sufficient for holiness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you have revealed to us in this letter. Father, we just humble ourselves before you and ask for you to teach us. Lord, I've had to say more about Romans 7 than actually walking through it. Would you please give us patience as we walk through this very challenging chapter? And all our desire is is that we want to just see Romans 7, for what you have set it there to be, help us to that end in the weeks to come. And Father, lift up our adoration of grace and your spirit and most of all, your son, Jesus. And it's in his great name we pray, amen.